Nyt sitten seuraavana vuorossa professori Richard Mitchell Kanadasta, Brokin yliopistosta. Ja, ja tota niin, ää, Richard on opiskellut Sterlingin yliopistossa ja hän on tehnyt väitöskirjansa lapsen oikeuksien sopimuksen käytöstä tai soveltamisesta tämmöisessä postmodernissa ajassa. Hän on lapsuustutkija ja nuorisotutkija ja hän käyttää mielenkiintoisia käsitteitä ja eilen tosiaan meillä oli tämmöinen pieni työpaja, jossa, joka oli aika inspiroiva. Ja kun me suunniteltiin näitä päiviä ja hänen vierailuaan tänne, niin hän muun muassa nosti esiin tällaisen jotenkin käsitteen kuin lapset epistemologisina sisäpiiriläisinä. Eli tietyllä tavalla semmoisena tiedon rakentamisen sisäpiiriläisinä. Ja se on hirveän keskeinen osa hänen ajatteluaan, että, että ne, jotka on jotenkin perinteisesti jääneet tiedon rakentamisen ulkopuolelle, niin pitäisi ottaa siihen sisäpiiriin mukaan. Hän on sen lisäksi, että hän on tutkija, niin hän on myös aika kokenut käytännön työntekijä. Hän on toiminut pitkään lastenpsykiatriassa ihan asiakastyössä ja sitten hän on myös itse ollut sijaisvanhempi. Eli hänellä, ja on, on muutenkin kokemusta lastensuojelusta, että hänellä on sekä tämmöinen käytännön että tutkimuksen äh, tuoma tausta. Okei, okay, so now I have told all kinds of things about you which you don't know anything about. <laughs> okay, I just told that, uh, told people that you are, you have also a background in practices and I told a little bit about your thesis and where you're from and things, but I didn't tell how we like came in contact, but let's tell that sometime later. Okay, but uh, the floor is yours now and we'll be happy to listen to you. Thank you so much. I trust they were all good things you shared. Um, Uh, greetings. I want to uh, start out with a degree of respect and humility and uh, an appreciation for you, sir, who brought forward uh, the notion and the truth that uh, a great deal of this work is fraught with fear and anxiety. And I appreciate you being that real about your own role. And I appreciated some of the questions I heard this morning about uh, what responsibility do we have to uh, protect children and to do uh, good work in the world. Uh, some of that responsibility I've taken up uh, from um, different areas of practice, as uh, Pybe uh, suggested, as well as uh, in the last part of my career, over the last 15 years or so, I've become a researcher and uh, tried to create new knowledge. And um, again, with a degree of uh, humility for uh, the limited um, value that sometimes new knowledge actually is. My students give me this uh, feedback all the time. Um, I'll begin this talk on transdisciplinarity, which is a rather new topic. It's a new discourse in uh, higher education around the world. And uh, I've connected it to a rather older uh, discussion of children's rights, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. So in the process, over the next half an hour, 40 minutes or so, I'm going to uh, invite you to consider the dimensions of transdisciplinarity as I found them in the literature for about 10 years. I'm going to invite you to consider how transdisciplinary thinking might aid both in child protection practice as well as in child protection research. And finally, I'm going to uh, present the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child to you as a transdisciplinary tool, uh, as I've come to understand and know it and believe that it, it still has a, a great deal of utility. Um, I'm a faculty member in an interdisciplinary child and youth studies department in Ontario. Ontario, Canada has 13.6 million people and 44 universities and colleges. Uh, right now our province is going through a downsizing of those universities and colleges because the, uh, our government uh, has decided a great deal of duplication exists in those universities. Um, I did my PhD in Stirling, Scotland for uh, three years, four years in the early 2000s. Uh, before that, for 20 years I was a counselor 
uh, frontline counselor in uh, uh, child and youth mental health, uh, child protection. I was a foster parent. I, I provided out-of-home care for high-risk youth. And uh, I worked in education, youth justice, and right across the spectrum of places where children and young people needed someone to give them a hand for a while. And that's what I did. I found I was always seeking common ground amongst, between children's family needs, service systems, and the larger society. And that's what I've continued to do as an academic. And the knowledge that I produce and create and try to discover myself uh, is, is continuing to do that, to seek for common ground. Because all of us are, are especially those of us in higher education, uh, I find we're in a Tower of Babel a lot. We're all talking in languages that we, we often don't understand uh, each other's um, knowledge and claims for knowledge. So this is what I've, I've continued to do in my work as an academic, seek out common ground. So my theoretical and methodological standpoint come directly from practice. I want to quickly tell you a story. One of the first young people I ever worked with was a, a boy uh, named Michael who was non-ambulatory and non-verbal. Uh, he was about 10 years old and uh, wore a diaper and um, needed to be fed. He had been given a diagnosis of microencephaly and he seizured uh, hundreds of times in a day. And Michael was being integrated into our so school system in British Columbia in the early 1980s. And when I was asked to work with him, it was because I'd had some uh, ambulance training. I knew how to uh, help people survive in life and death circumstances. And they hired me to keep from being sued if Michael died in school time. That's really what the job was. And it scared the living daylight out of me, speaking of fear and anxiety. And uh, I, I spent weeks and weeks, months with Michael, wondering how in God's name I was going to do anything of value uh, with this person who appeared initially so weak and so powerless, nonverbal and nonambulatory. Gradually, I began to understand Michael had great dignity and great power. And he taught me... Uh, some of the earliest lessons I learned from practice, the inherent dignity and value in every child, regardless of how they appear or where they're from or what their presentation. I became good friends with Michael after a while, discovered how he laughed and talked and uh, uh, um, built a bridge where I could uh, engage with Michael in a meaningful way day after day. And I bring his story to you to, to reflect on that each of you also have stories like this in uh, the work that you do. Uh, again, coming back to my theoretical and methodological standpoint in research, I brought that uh, notion that individual kids' voices matter research and they're often uh, lost in the stories we tell about our knowledge production. Uh, this has brought me to critical theorists such as Paulo Freire, a great Brazilian uh, educator uh, uh, responsible for a work in the 70s called uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, uh, social cultural and feminist thinkers, and uh, eventually I came to the notion of transdisciplinarity and I'm going to discuss some of that for you and for application in your work and in unpacking the kind of knowledges that academics and researchers throw out to you year in and year out to uh, help aid your practice. I've always been asking the question in the complexity of our times, is the child rights glass half full or is it half empty? Climate change, the draining of aqu aquifers, melting ice caps, the Syrian war, asylum seekers. Uh, this is an aside, but it isn't. The little boy that was on the beach a month ago in Turkey was on his way to Canada. And his, uh, uh, the family had written his aunt, who lives in Vancouver. And uh, uh, his aunt had tried to uh, uh, um, lobby our government so they could come to Canada, and the government had refused. So they were left with no choice but to pay for that passage across the sea where in that little boy and the rest of the family lost their lives. So is that little boy our neighbor? Is he my neighbor? I consider that he is in some meaningful way. So when I'm confronted with this, what, what do I, how do I begin to assess my own contribution in, in the world of knowledge production and the kind of knowledge that I uh, 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 hold out to you as meaningful? 
I've begun to look at uh, databases where greater health and longer life are obvious. Uh, there's a Swedish statistician named Hans Rosling. If no one has ever run into his work, I urge you to go home tonight and download his 20-minute TED Talk and be inspired about the times we find ourselves. 50 years worth of child health and well-being, uh, uh, empirical data that he's collected over uh, the decades shows that the human race has never been in better shape. Longer life, great, uh, greater health, global knowledge systems. Open access means that the knowledge that I publish can be freely available to anyone on the planet who can access the internet, and just about everyone is, all right? Uh, wind power, electric transportation, these are all hopeful developments. And they do have meaning in the area of knowledge production where children are. The greatest challenge that children have and are going to inherit from us, the elders that are passing it on, is climate change. It's climate change and how we uh, begin to locate, relocate our work into the ecosystems we inhabit. And I'll just go right out on the record putting that out. Okay, I want to come back to the theme. And one of my aims is a discussion of transdisciplinarity and how it might ha have some value for you in your work. Um, the earliest location of the word in the literature, uh, uh, three individuals in the early 70s coined the phrase at the same time and began to use it in their work. Uh, um, perhaps not coincidentally, John Piaget, you know, great, well-known Swiss uh, child developmentalist, child developmentalist, thank you, a sociologist from France named Edgar Morin, and an Australian astrophysicist, Eric Jange, all began using the term transdisciplinarity simultaneously in the 70s. The most widely referenced author is a Romanian astrophysicist who founded a transdisciplinary institute at UNESCO in Paris in the 80s, and he would be probably the widest uh, known and referenced author when you uh, uh, um, Google transdisciplinarity. Um, he observed in a 2002 text that the term retains a certain charm mostly because it has not yet been corrupted by time, but perhaps that time has arrived since he wrote those words. I'm not certain. We'll puzzle through some of that today. Uh, the best lit view on transdisciplinarity has been put together by two Canadian health scientists in clinical and investigative uh, medicine, the journal. Uh, they did a, a three-part meta-analysis of literature around the world, thousands of pieces of literature that claimed to be transdisciplinary. And what they found was that these terms multi and inter and trans are often used interchangeably without clear understanding or distinction. The three terms are conflated as though they were all the same thing. And I'll go through some steps that I've looked uh, into and found in the literature that show the distinctions. Uh, Albrecht et al, and I'll get to a little bit more of their work, um, they argue, health epidemiologists from Australia, that transdisciplinarity reflects the complexity that underpins health and social sciences and allows an emergence of interplay across disciplines and theories for multi-level explanations of problems. Where this fits into the complexity of social work is obvious to me. We need different level and multi-level systemic uh, answers to the questions we have about how to protect children. By the time it comes to your attention to protect children, it's too late, frequently. And I want to let you know that the job of child protection is everyone's job, not just social workers. You can't do this job alone. We use you as scapegoats. We want you to protect all the children in the community, and yet the sad and ugly truth is that we're going to beat and molest and abuse and murder children as long as all of us are breathing air. And it's a horrible truth that is true in my culture, in my society, and in yours, and in societies around the world. And somehow social workers, after 100, 150 years of development of your field, have ended up bearing the brunt of that and bearing the responsibility. So I want to let you know, in one small and humble way, one person takes some of that responsibility home with me at night. I share the job with you in some real way that kind of escapes us all. At any rate, we come back to thinking about transdisciplinarity and are struck with the conundrum of violence towards children. What, do, you know, what can we do about this using this tool? 
I'd also point out another great thinker in looking at uh, human rights and multiculturalism, a Portuguese sociologist named de Souza Santos, written some provocative and powerful literature on knowledge production, which is what we're talking about a little bit here today, and uh, how the global north uh, knowledge machinery has excluded global self epistemologies. And uh, the term he uses is epistemicide. It's a dramatic term, but it's, uh, it, it points to the exclusion of knowledges that have been carried on on this planet for centuries that come from southern indigenous epistemologies. And de Sousa Santos lives and works over in, uh, in a Portuguese university, Chambria, I believe is the name of it. Nicolescu, again, uh, the most widely referenced author in this. These are the distinctions between multi, inter, and trans. And, and I'll just point out the obvious. Transdisciplinary perspectives are transformative. There's something new happening. There's something new happening in the field of child protection. And uh, some of it comes out of an understanding of the Convention on the Rights of the Child over the last 25 years. Um, and I'll, I'll put out this stat for you to, to consider and wonder with me. In 1990, when the World Summit for Children introduced the Convention on the Rights of the Child to the world community, um, that day, 45,500 children under five died. Uh, an empirical database called the Under Five Mortality Rates are probably the most solid empirical database and measure of human civilization that exists. It's collected every year uh, by WHO and UNICEF. And on that day in 1990, with about 3 billion people on the planet, there were 45,500 children under five dying every day. We fast forward to this past year, and those statistics reflect uh, almost a doubling in that population, really a doubling, uh, as I understand it, um, and, and uh, recall who was alive in 1990 and who is alive now. And that mortality rate is, uh, has been cut to a third. So something extraordinary is going on in human history that we're often unable to pay attention to because we're locked up in our own uh, uh, nation state and we're locked up in our own knowledge production system, in our own culture, and in our own lives. But it, it, there's a few thinkers around us that are pointing to global systems of, of knowledge, and I've located them within this transdisciplinary discussion. Uh, coming back to these guys, Albrecht Freeman and Higginbottom, Aussie health scientists, they've delineated the difference in transdisciplinary thinking epistemologically, methodologically, and onto ontologically. I am not going to read these things to you. If anybody wants this set of PowerPoints, I'll send them freely to you. This is all information that I've collected that's out there available if you looked for it, and I'll save you the bother. I'll give it to you. This is the way I understand knowledge creation. I'm a public servant. I'm a person who is paid by my country's tax dollars. And I find, um, in, in, um, I find too many arrogant academics in my world. And as I travel around, there's a lot of us who have our nose in the air about how much we know. You know what? It's a sand grain. All the stuff I've collected, my PhD and everything I know, can be reduced to a sand grain. I wake up every morning and I think, oh my God, how much is there left to know? And I was saying yesterday, for me, it's like Christmas. I wake up every morning and think, I wonder what I can discover today. So this is freely available for me. I will hand it to you with, again, uh, with a great degree of respect and humility, if anybody wants this stuff. Pardon me. The six, I found, after 10 years of looking into this field, I found six dimensions of transdisciplinarity, and here they are. Uh, and the key thing for social workers is that thinking transdisciplinarity, transdisciplinarily, will bring you into complex adaptive systems, Complexity theory, or chaos theory, or game theory uh, has begun to draw on this work, and I'll get to the individual who started that in the 50s and 60s, Lorenz. But it's really like the weather, like earthquakes. We know they're going to happen, but nobody can predict them. And I'm going to bring it back home to each of you who are social workers here. We know that children are going to die, but we cannot predict who or where or when. Now we can have intuition and we can use all the sophisticated measurement tools that we have at our disposal and we still can't stop this. So a more appropriate 
conceptual framework for our work, I've found, is this complex systems theory. And I found it because others have gone there. You don't have to take my word for it. I'll share the literature where I've located uh, uh, from other social work uh, uh, professors and researchers who have indicated this. Transdisciplinarity is a global reform movement in higher education originating over here in European sites in the 1970s. It is critically oriented. The systems of knowledge production we have have kind of played themselves out, okay? Disciplines have reached the limit of their capacity to actually keep their walls and silos intact. All of the disciplines that we uh, inhabit and get uh, trained in, as soon as you go out into the workforce, you know that that knowledge is very, very limited. So we, we need to draw on um, epidemiology, health, uh, psychology, uh, science. Climate change is going to impact us, and already is in lots of places on the planet, in a way that uh, drives people into your social work office. The first time I, this struck me, I was at the UN in uh, 2007, and I went to a workshop on climate refugees, who are going to be children. They're going to be drowned out of their homes in some uh, southern location. So uh, the knowledges that we need to access are becoming complex and sophisticated, but we're complex and sophisticated people. You're sitting there with the capacity to find out whether anything I'm telling you is true right now. You can do this, and my students do this for me all the time by the way, so this is one of the reasons why I bring this to our attention. Um, transdisciplinarity is critically oriented, and we're trying to reintegrate uh, research that's open to the humanities. Imagine a physicist and a biologist and a chemist sitting down with an artist and a poet, or a child creating art and poetry in a therapeutic alliance. These kind of partnerships are still a little novel, but they need to occur. They need to occur, and they are occurring. In, including spiritual paradigms, not sectarian or even religious, but spiritual. Three more key dimensions. It's problem focused on issues outside academia with non-academic partners. Novel concept, boy, in my university, trying to get research funds to work with non-academic partners. Wow. It's been very difficult, but it's happening. It's, uh, throughout the literature, you find participatory action methodologies but not solely based on participatory action principles, but on these other principles. And finally, what I've noticed after 10 years of looking into it is that post-colonial literature includes something called indigenous epistemologies. And really, if I had to reduce the term indigenous epistemologies down to a couple of um, sound bites, it would be humans are located within nature. We're part of nature and we'll return to nature. And all traditional cultures around the world still have that wisdom and they didn't have to go to university like I did for 17 years to have it. They've continued to locate themselves in the natural world. And what I found in post-colonial literature in North America, South America, New Zealand, and Australia, that these epistemologies and researchers doing work with indigenous communities and children are including these ways of knowing. What I found in the European literature, that they're not. A lot of the European literature that's coming out and coining itself as transdisciplinarity does not include indigenous thinking as yet. And, surprisingly, because Jean Piaget was one of the first um, to coin the term transdisciplinary. There's very little childhood studies literature using this term. Uh, Pivey and I uh, 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 got in contact with each other. I put out a question on a uh, research uh, portal on the internet. Is anyone doing transdisciplinary child studies work? And the echo came back some weeks or months later and we began to have a dialogue and that's why I'm here today. Um, this expert study, and uh, uh, don't get me going about experts, I don't think there are any more experts amongst us. The knowledges that are exploding on the planet right now are too vast and coming at us in too uh, much complexity for anyone to claim being an expert. And I blew up the concept, the construct of best practices yesterday in my workshop. How dare you claim best practice? No one here and no one anywhere as long as you live, will conduct a piece of research that has seven billion participants. Otherwise, you cannot claim best practice. You can, and I do, claim good practice. And that's as far as I'll go. And it, it, it speaks to the 
humility that we've lost somewhere along the way in our knowledge uh, machinery, that there are real limitations to everything we produce in, in research. And we need to continue in that way uh, in order to find new things out. So, I'm fairly didactic about this, and you know, I apologize in advance if I sound like I know something. It's contradictory to what I'm trying to say to you. But, you know, I'm adamant that there's some things that need to be reformed in higher education. After my 15 years of work in that field, it's uh, similar to all the other fields I inhabited where children's voices and views are spoken of but rarely heard. Um, this is one of the reasons academics are too busy hearing their own words and voices. Um, I have a text back here, a, a 214 text from Pycroft et al. Um, that I would suggest, and I, again, I'll share any of this literature with you. It's about complexity thinking in social work and criminology. And it brings these ideas a little bit closer home to you in your practice. If, in fact, uh, uh, listening to practitioners and, and uh, researchers in social work who have used some of these ideas a little bit more than I, uh, would be a value for you. Here's one of the messages. Pycroft observes how social work, criminal justice, and healthcare use scientific methods based upon Newtonian and Cartesian logic that's been around for a few centuries. This results in a linear, mechanistic approach to understanding risk and research. And the holy grail of social work is, is having a tool that can actually evaluate and measure and predict risk. There's a great deal of discourse coming out now saying, this is fallacious. We can't predict anything. We simply can't. It's too complex and chaotic out there. And you know this in your work. And I'm going to come back to the uh, uh, example. We know an earthquake is going to occur. We know a tsunami is going to occur. But we can't predict them with all the best science we have at our disposal. If we could, we, we, we'd be doing that. So why do we expect to be able to do it in child protection? It's based on a hundred-year-old set of patriarchal uh, principles that have left you guys holding the bag. And I, you know, I used to include myself with you folks doing social work because I lived in, and earned my living for 20 years doing it. The thing that Pycrop brought to my attention, and this gets more interesting here in a couple of minutes, the Newtonian paradigm, this, this kind of scientific method that we've depended on for centuries, allows no scope for free will or human purpose of action. We've lost the human in our scientific methodologies. And uh, transdisciplinarity is beginning to claim a return of the subject into the uh, logic of the included middle. Rather than the subject and the object, the subject is included in the middle. And it's a little esoteric. But uh, go and check out what uh, Nicolescu is talking about this. And it amounts to this, that it, w our free will and our purpose of actions still really matter. Stevens and Hassett, two Scottish, uh, Scott and a Brit social worker, now uh, professors and retired as far as I know. Looking at the complexity and risk theory in child protection, they observe, as I've been saying, earthquakes and tsunamis, but we cannot predict them. Trying to predict outcomes on the basis of in-depth knowledge of factors making up any complex system is fallacious because the ability to predict is based on linear thinking. They claim that moving from linear risk models to complexity, which is based on the work of Lorenz from the 50s and 60s on studying weather, he was the first person to coin the phrase the butterfly effect, which amounts to this. Accurate analysis of any behavior or any phenomenon requires a sensitive dependence on initial conditions, a phenomenon he described as the butterfly effect. And many of us would have heard of this. It's returning the subject and our willful decision into our research programs, this concept. Current dominant models for child protection in, in, my, uh, in any field of childhood studies are based on uh, linear predictive models to try and understand and inform practice. And they don't work. You know it and I know it. Let's just do a full stop there for a minute. They don't work. And knowledge production in this area has reached, it, it's exhausted its capacity to inform us 
And you know it, and I know it, and we know it, and I'm not stepping out on much of a limb here, coming into a country where I'm a guest, and I'm humbled to be asked here. For heaven's sake, I need 50 social workers to come to Canada and help us with our mess. At any rate, I, I, I step out here a little bit and, and identify with you what you already know. These models are no longer working, all right? Complex adaptive systems like the weather and families and society do not follow linear models. They follow power laws, identify Hassett and Stevens. And here's their example of what power laws look like. For every thousand minor injuries, thousand bruises, cuts, minor burns that are treated in the house, there are likely to be a hundred less minor injuries like bumps to the head, deep cuts, persistent pain requiring medical intervention. And this is all occurring well before you have statutory requirement to get involved in these families' lives. Those hundred bruises requiring medical attention are there for some of us to identify and bring to the attention of all of us. Those 100 cuts, persistent pain, and requiring medical attention also have contained in them 10 major injuries, like broken bones, severe burns requiring hospitalization, and they identified that out of those numbers, one fatality exists. And that's how they've constructed their model for understanding child abuse, child neglect, and death. It has just as much to inform our work and our research as any of the other models we've been depending on to produce good knowledge. And don't get me wrong. I live in a community with a 10-year-old and a 7-year-old, and it's important statistical knowledge for me to know how many sex offenders have been released and are on parole in my region. I can access that knowledge. I can't access where they live or what they're doing. But I can access the knowledge of the number of sex offenders that have been released. And I'm, I'm comforted by knowing what the degree of risk is in my neighborhood when I send my kids out to play or to school. So I'm not saying throwing out the statistical baby with the bathwater at all. I am suggesting, though, that we temper our understanding of how good knowledge looks. So, complexity that underpins health and the social science allows an interplay across disciplines and theories. Imagine us doing a piece of research with kids and a jazz musician. You know, a poet, and I've done research, good research, on, um, uh, with a, a, a chair of drama in my um, university who, uh, you know, wrote good, great plays about children and uh, migrant children in Canada. And uh, these are not well-funded, believe me. It's very difficult to convince funders to do these transdisciplinary, not just cross-sectoral and cross-disciplinary projects, but th the relocation of human free will into our research programs is one of the, uh, the real nuggets in this discussion of what transdisciplinarity is and is not. Uh, the first time I read it was uh, two American educators, Giroux and Cyril Giroux, and they identified that although we might be forced to work within academic disciplines, and we are, researchers, academics, educators, we could choose to develop transdisciplinary tools. And when I saw that, I wondered, well, what kind of a transdisciplinary tool do I have at my disposal to conduct good research? In an interdisciplinary childhood studies department, I looked at the value of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child once again and saw that. It's, it's a, a child rights approach has something to tell educators, has something to tell psychiatrists and medical personnel, has something to tell social workers and, uh, uh, and so on, uh, police and uh, uh, probation officers and so on and so forth. So the convention, again, I looked at it again in this non-legal way. I understand it as law and it's been embedded in lots of statutes, but it's, it's not only law. It's about civilization. If you look back in the 25 years since it's been around in the human race, great changes have happened because of the convention. And we can measure those changes empirically. And uh, that's part of what I do in my research. At any rate, I see also the ancient word for bringing theory out of the ether and putting it to work in real people's lives, praxis, as part of this story of transdisciplinary tools. Rights-based research with young people has shown an evidence of a shift we're moving away from the debate about protection versus participation. It's both. It's just both. 
Babies who have no parents, for example, need someone from society to step in and protect them and give them what they require to grow up to be adults. And as they grow up, they need to be able to participate meaningfully in sustainable processes in all of our systems, not just one-off. Um, the recent understanding that I use in my, all of my coursework and all of my um, research and publications is child as citizen. And this is recrafting and reconstructing any notion of citizenship. Citizenship used to be located in the nation state alone, and it's been used historically to exclude women and ethnic minorities and children up until 25 years ago, and now the convention is turning that on its head. Child citizenship, and we did it yesterday in the workshop, if you Google that, immediately, within milliseconds, you'll come up with tens of millions of websites and tens of millions of research spaces where child as citizen is, uh, has been their subject of inquiry. So uh, citizenship is political. And the thing we've forgotten about the convention and the thing that we might have forgotten about childhood is that childhood is political. And engaging children and young people in a discussion of their human rights and making sure their human rights are not violated can be a very political act. And it frequently is. And we've lost that because we're still busy protecting and saving children. That's still coming out of a, you know, a century-old paradigm. This paradigm is moving it along and recrafting our understanding of how to be with kids. Biggest challenge, always. We have these little kids in the midst of the you know, circle of uh, professionals, and how do we bring meaningful participation into our research, into our work? It can't just be one off. We need to engage kids as epistemological insiders. I've claimed that in one of my papers recently. They have incipient insider knowledge into their own therapy their own well-being that we ignore at our peril. They're partners, co-creators of knowledge, if you allow that. I had just one hell of a time trying to um, publish a chapter with 14 and 15-year-olds, getting research ethics in my university to okay the fact that 14 and 15-year-olds weren't objects of study, weren't data, but were actually co-constructing knowledge with me. And eventually I acquiesced because I wanted their names to be in, in a publication, and I went and got the parents' consent. <laughs> and it was just, I felt defeated, and I still do. You can hear it in my voice. <laughs> but I'm still, you know, fighting the good fight. Kids, as publishers and co-creators of knowledge, if you want to look into some great research that uh, is being done in London, in England, uh, Mary Kellett. K-E-L-L-E-T-T. -T. She's co-constructed lots of research with kids who develop their own questions, go out and collect their own data. And, you know, no surprise that kids are interested in different kinds of research questions than we are, but just as meaningful into their lives. Mary Kellett. So, something that we forgot as we grapple with what the convention is and what it isn't, is that participation, Article 12, is dependent on these other three principles. Two, three, and everyone believes they're doing, you know, the best interests of the child, but Article 6 just gets overlooked. We're busy, we're in the business of creating well-being and um, maxim survival and maximum development. And for some reason, this has been lost in the discourse of children's rights over the last 25 years. It isn't when it comes to the reporting process. The committee in Geneva looks and evaluates our work on children's rights using all four of these principles as an organizing framework for their evaluation of where we stand, each of our nation states. I was talking yesterday to folks here in a workshop and, you know, these reports are called Concluding Observations on Finland. When I was coming here, I just downloaded them and read about the kind of research that the committee is asking you to produce. And it's the same process in every country. A, a Saudi student, a, a Saudi Arabian woman, came to me last January and wanted to work with me. And I just downloaded uh, the Saudi report, the Concluding Observations on Saudi, and became informed about uh, what the issues for child protection, education, and so forth are in Saudi and in Honduras last year, and so on and so forth. These are untapped resources for child protection knowledge and child well-being knowledge. So coming back here, I've, I've published a few times this model. It's very easy. 42. What kind of knowledge do you want to uh, d uh, share with kids about children's rights? Article 42 was added in there. 
by the architects of the convention from 1979 to 1989, as they uh, produced that uh, global treaty and framework, they got to the end of it and they thought, how do we know if anybody's actually, avail uh, actually implementing the Convention on the Rights of the Child? So if you read Article 42, it's two lines. It says simply that we'll tell adults and children about the convention. But what will we tell them? We'll tell them the principles and the provisions. And the four principles are back here right there, 2, 3, 6, and 12. So in 42, it's an indicator, an international indicator, that you can trust me. I got this from a person who actually worked on the treaty over the 10-year period. It's been placed in there so that Geneva and the Committee on the Rights of the Child could evaluate and measure whether we're actually doing it, and the reporting process under Article 44 which is really um, draft jurisprudence for those of us that have legal minds and, and a legal background. What we've seen over 25 years is as the reporting process takes place, the committee recommends to different uh, nation state stakeholders to produce different legislation. I'm sure if I looked into it here, that's what's occurred in Finland as well. There's legislation and new statutes that reflect the convention. So those reports are actually draft jurisprudence and give you some insight about areas in your own work that, uh, that are of value in terms of knowledge, new knowledge. So we come back here, and I hope, again, and in great respect for the work that you're doing and the burdens you carry home sometimes at night and that keep you awake and, and keep you from sleeping. Because I know the work, and it's kept me sleepless more than once. With great respect and great humility coming in here and waving my finger as I do. I can't help that. That's how I teach. And it's just, you know, just my style. So forgive me in advance. I bring this to your attention that transdisciplinarity is a reform movement, a global reform movement, 40 years old. And the next time you hear that term, you'll have a little bit of knowledge about what it means and what it doesn't mean. It is not interchangeable with multi or interdisciplinarity. It is about transforming knowledge production globally. It's understanding that particularly in the area of childhood studies, we might have already created a new field that is taking advantage of all the other fields, science, humanities, arts, social sciences, and created a new one. I hope that transdisciplinary thinking has in some way given you some motivation to, to keep looking into new research in your own work, because there's all the time new stuff happening that can you know, be of some value in your thinking, because thinking still matters. Thinking new things allows us to behave differently and in new ways. And again, although the Convention on the Rights of the Child is an old story and 25 years old, uh, I've reviewed it in a way that I hope you see it as a transdisciplinary tool. There may be many others out there, but I've made a pretty good claim in my own research and in this uh, presentation here today that uh, the UNCRC is a de facto transdisciplinary tool. Thank you. <laughs> Grappling with the notion of uh, creating a new word in Finnish because there are Finn words for multidisciplinarity and, and interdisciplinarity, but not transdisciplinarity. So I leave you with that task. Come up with a new word in your own language. Okay, thank you, Richard. Uh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, Richard was with us yesterday for a whole day workshop, and uh, at least I got very inspired, but also a bit overwhelmed about all the new like thinking that he brought brought with us. And at least for me, the idea of transdisciplinarity as a transformative reform <laughs> uh, movement is is actually new. I had never thought about it in that sense. And transdisciplinarity as something that is trying to solve real-world problems with people from the real world, not only the academia, was also something new to me. I don't know if it's new to you. No need. But anyway, I don't know if we should uh, talk in English or in Finnish. If, if, if Richard is included, then we maybe should, should speak in English. But he's also having a translator here. Eli Richardilla on täällä tulkki, eli jos haluatte tässä kohtaa 
kysyä kys, muutamia kysymyksiä tai käydä vähän keskustelua, niin se on mahdollista suomen kielelläkin. Ja sitten tuon Jaakon esityksen jälkeen me käydään vielä vähän sellaista yhdistel, yhdistelevää keskustelua. Sielläkin on vielä aikaa. Mutta jos teillä on tässä vaiheessa kysymyksiä liittyen tähän transdisciplinary-käsitteeseen tai lapsen oikeuksien sopimukseen tällaisena monitieteisen yhteisen työskentely- ja ajattelun välineenä tai, tai mihinkään, mitä hän tässä toi esiin, niin olkaa hyvä. Hello, Richard. I come from uh, area of outdoor education and we are studying resilient methods uh, to work with. And I think the discipline will help to focus the research questions into resilience more than on risk-based systems. So what do you think about it? Thank you for bringing it back to practice. I, I would use this thinking in trying as much as I could on my own, as well as with my colleagues, to generate different kinds of questions and be open to different kinds of knowledges. Those of artists, those of musicians, those of poets, those of you know, chemists and so forth, because everyone has knowledge to create questions that impact kids in care. And, and this is something, because of our uh, training as experts and professionals, w we've ended up too rigid, I think. This is my argument. So coming back to how to generate new questions in residential care, ask people that you've never asked before. Maybe retired elders in the community that have never uh, gone to university. I, I don't know what w would work, but it's, it's definitely stepping outside the box, but it's legitimized theoretically and politically by this thinking. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Mitäs muita ajatuksia heräsikö tässä kuunnellessa vai tietysti näihin voi vielä palata sitten kun on hetken aikaa sulatellutkin tätä, tätä esitystä. <tos>